It's one of the most haunting images in our collective memory. On November 22, 1963, a shell shock Jacqueline Kennedy stands next to Lyndon Baines Johnson as he is sworn in on Air Force One following the assassination of her husband. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. The nation is still in the early stages of grief when Johnson addresses Congress five days later. My fellow Americans, all I have, I would have given gladly not to be standing here today. It feels like the end of an era, but in the fierce urgency of now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the battle for the great society, Princeton professor Julian Zelitzer reminds us that it was also the beginning of a new one. I've always wanted to ultimately write a book that brought the decade together, that put all the different pieces into one big story about what happened during these transformative years in American politics. The morning after Kennedy's death, Johnson called his top advisors in at 4 a.m. to tell them his plans. He would rescue Kennedy's tax cut bill and he would address the simmering rage of segregation by passing Kennedy's civil rights bill, which was still stuck in Congress a full three months after the movement's historic march on Washington. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. After that, we'll pass legislation that allows everyone anywhere in this country to vote with all the barriers down, and that's not all. We're gonna get a law that says every boy and girl in this country, no matter how poor, or the color of their skin, or the region they come from, is gonna be able to get all the education they can take by loan, scholarship, or grant right from the federal government. Johnson would go on to accomplish all that and more. Over the next three years, he drove the passage of one of the most liberal legislative agendas in modern history from civil rights to Medicare, Medicaid, the Clean Air Act, and the War on Poverty, collectively dubbed the Great Society. And he did it with a conservative Congress. Find out how he accomplished that and why some of his greatest achievements later became his undoing in this political edition of Maryville Talks Books, one-on-one -on -one with Julian Zelitzer. Presented by Maryville University and Left Bank Books and media sponsors St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU and HEC TV. Welcome, Julian Zelitzer. It's so good to have you here today. Thanks for having me. What caused you to want to write this book? Well, it's a book I've been writing in many ways for decades. So since graduate school, I've been working on the 1960s. I've been writing about different parts of the decade from members of Congress to the White House. Uh, so I've always wanted to ultimately write a book that brought the decade together, that put all the different pieces into one big story about what happened during these transformative years in American politics. And so I knew the 50th anniversary was coming of the Great Society, and I decided this was a perfect time, uh, and that I in some ways had matured to the point that I could write this. You've mentioned that there are a lot of myths that surround this time and how the legislative process worked. Mm -hmm. Well, there's two myths that the book uh, really talks about and tries to demolish uh, or challenge. One is the myth of Lyndon Johnson, and we now have this image of him uh, as an all-powerful politician, the guy who could do what no one else could do in Washington, the guy who knew how to twist every arm and how to bully his opponents and seduce his supporters into supporting legislation that he wanted. Uh, and while he was a great politician, we've hit the point where we kind of overemphasize how much he could do on his own. Uh, and I want to talk about the Great Society as being more than just about Lyndon Johnson. The second myth is that this is a liberal era in American politics. And this was the heyday of liberalism so that big programs like Medicare, voting rights passed easily. But when you look at Congress, conservatives ruled the roost. Southern Democrats and Republicans had all the power in that institution. And so I put that at the center of the story and ask, how did they overcome this conservative coalition? Your opening sentence is, uh, Lyndon Johnson hated being vice president. He hated it. It was the worst job for him. He had loved being the Senate Majority Leader in the 1950s, both because he could do a lot of stuff, and he loved Congress. He was a creature of Congress. This was his home in many ways. He loved the people there. He loved the process. 
Uh, as vice president, he didn't do much. Uh, it was a job at that time, wasn't very important, but the Kennedy people also didn't like him. So they kept him uh, in the room, so to speak. They wanted to contain him and they didn't want him to cause problems. So in 63, when Kennedy's killed, he's very frustrated and he feels that he's not being used very effectively. Did Johnson suspect that that's what would happen as a vice president or was he, was he disappointed and surprised at how much he was cut out from things? He suspected it, but he was also disappointed when it happened. So when he took the nomination in 1960, he realized in some ways it was a step down. He wanted to be president. He didn't want to be the second in command and certainly not to John F. Kennedy, this young politician uh, who he didn't think deserved to be in that office. But as the process emerged, I think he was used even less than he thought most vice presidents were used. And uh, I think over time he just was, he really was frustrated and angry uh, about where he was by the end of that period. There's been a lot of controversy and speculation about his relationship with civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King Jr. and the others, which of course was stoked a bit by I Selma and the way Selma Johnson was depicted. Like yeah, that's been a big issue. The film Selma uh, depicts Lyndon Johnson as either hesitant uh, or indifferent or even hostile to voting rights in 1965 before the marches take place in Selma. Help Dr. King, this thing's just going to have to wait. It cannot wait. You've got one big issue, i got 101. My book sees it much more as a partnership, that by this point in his career, he's very sympathetic to the civil rights cause, and he's really trying to figure out how to get voting rights through Congress, not whether to do it. And he's working with Martin Luther King during these years, uh, he's trying to get King to help him with the problem he faces, that Congress is not necessarily going to move on this. So he wants King to help him build grassroots pressure to change the minds of people in Congress so that he could get this legislation through. Uh, the movie takes a different uh, tact, has a different approach, and it stimulated uh, a pretty fierce debate over the movie and over Lyndon Johnson and the civil rights movement. How did the civil rights leaders view him throughout this process? Did they prefer him to Kennedy? It was mixed. There were many liberal civil rights activists and others who were always uh, a little skeptical about Johnson. They worried he was a Southerner. He had been mentored by Southerners who were the conservatives in Washington. And they worried that he was really a conservative uh, who was hiding in liberal clothing and that ultimately he wouldn't support them. But in the early 60s through 1965, many leaders, including Martin Luther King, came to believe he was the real thing. Uh, and in many ways, they trusted him more than Kennedy. They gained a sense that this was a president who was willing to commit his political capital to the cause of racial equality. And the first major bill he deals with is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ends segregation uh, in public accommodations and public facilities. And after that, many understand he's not faking it. Uh, and they do like him very much. That will uh, change into more tension by 1966 and 67. But in the mid-60s, there are many civil rights leaders uh, who believe that for all his flaws, this is a president who's on their side. As you said, you've kind of been writing around this topic for much of your professional life, but was it interesting to you even to see just how touch and go it was at times? It's very interesting. I mean, I love Congress and I love studying Congress and uh, for all its flaws, I find it a fascinating institution. And at its essence, Congress is democracy. And the fights that take place, the messiness of the legislative process, in my mind, is often the messiness of our democracy. So as I got into this with civil rights, it was fascinating to see how this legislation, which we all learn about in school, uh, which is really the first thing uh, that comes up in the textbooks about the 1960s, what it took to get that from being an idea uh, to an actual bill. Uh, and it's a lot of touch and go, it's a lot of compromise, it's a lot of pretty brutal politics and sometimes, uh, you know, comical stories. One so-called uh, detail ended up becoming a pretty huge part too, and that was the gender equality or gender protection. That was supposed to be uh, a weight to sink it, and it turned out to be the opposite. Yeah, it's a great story that when this is in the House of Representatives, the Civil Rights Act of 64 is being debated on the floor, and one of the main Southern conservatives, Howard Smith, uh, who was the chairman of the House Rules Committee, this tall, lanky fellow uh, who you know, grew up in a plantation uh, from the 19th century, he's trying to figure out how can he stop this bill, 
which seems like it's going to pass because the civil rights movement had changed public opinion fundamentally. So what he does is he inserts a provision that says the bill will not only uh, ensure racial equality, it will ensure gender equality as well. And he thought that would actually cause people not to vote for it. Uh, and some proponents, women in Congress who are strong proponents of women's rights, actually reject it because they fear that this is going to kill the bill. But it passes. It actually passes by large margins, and it's part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I guess another example of that sort of growing feeling in the nation that the time is now. Yes, and that's, you know, one of the themes of the book is that in that first year of Johnson's presidency, it's not simply Johnson's tricks that get the Civil Rights Act through. It's the movement was a changing public opinion and legislative opinion in profound ways. Many Republicans, like Everett Dirksen, concluded that they could no longer afford to stand in the way of this bill. They were hearing from constituents, they were hearing from religious leaders in their community that this had to come up for a vote. Uh, and that's the work of Martin Luther King, that's the work of hundreds and thousands of uh, civil rights activists whose names we don't even know who had that impact on Washington. The images and photographs and newsreel from that period, some of which you feature in the book, are so powerful. Martin Luther King was really a legislative strategist. He wasn't just an organizer. He wasn't just a great speaker. He understood that these protests, which often uh, incited the violence of Southern whites and police in the South, would have a big effect on national opinion. So uh, these protests were really fundamental as people watched them on television protests like the ones that occurred in Selma, uh, to changing the tenor of debate in Congress on these bills. At one point you write, the Southerners were losing the public relations war. They were, and I think many of them knew this. On the first two bills, uh, by 1965, many Southerners understood they could no longer count on Republicans to support them, uh, and that the numbers of liberals, proponents of civil rights and other issues, were winning out. After the 1964 election against Barry Goldwater, where Johnson decimates him and Democrats have these huge liberal majorities, Southerners understand that, at least for the time being, uh, they were going to lose on all the major debates of the time. One of the things you explore that we often forget about is the role that religious organizations and, and different faiths played in pushing this along. Yeah, this was one of those parts of the book where I learned a lot as I was researching this. And religious leaders were essential to the civil rights struggle. And religious leaders who in the Midwest are major figures in, in communities and are able to get the attention of members of Congress. So uh, during the spring of 1964, most Republicans have visits um, from uh, preachers who come to Washington and say, you have to let this bill come up for a vote. National religious organizations would coordinate with local preachers to deliver sermons every week that conveyed the message that the civil rights cause was one whose time had come. And they would urge their congregants to write letters uh, to their members uh, to vote uh, for the bill to move through. Some seminarians in 1964 come to Washington and they hold 24-hour vigils, which the media covers, to gain attention for this cause as well. That made it a moral issue. It made it a moral issue, and it also made it an issue where uh, many of these Republicans were worried about saying no, uh, because it was one thing to say no to civil rights, it was another to say no to religious leaders in their community who had a lot of clout who were saying this is something that you need to do. On July 2nd, 1964, President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law. The next year, he did the same for voting rights. But the country's social and political landscape was beginning to change. The war in Vietnam was escalating, and a new kind of racial unrest was spreading. Just one week after the voting rights ceremony, a deadly six-day race riot broke out in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. As the violence spread to other cities, it fueled a white backlash that threatened the future of another crucial civil rights issue, fair housing. It's a big part of the story. So in 1966, Johnson moves with what was the third pillar in his mind of the civil rights agenda. First was desegregation, then was voting rights, and then came housing. Uh, and he proposes this bill to Congress that will ensure fair housing, no racial discrimination, uh, in the sale or rental of housing. And it causes, this is 1966, a huge backlash. 
not just Republicans, but many Democrats from traditionally liberal areas like the city of Chicago are hearing from constituents uh, that they don't support this. They're scared this will affect their property values. They're scared about the resale of their homes. And it becomes part of the 1966 midterms where many liberals lose their seats because of a backlash to the bill. Uh, Paul Douglas, who's a liberal Democrat from Illinois, uh, really an icon of liberals who had been a champion of civil rights, loses his seat uh, as a result of, of how many constituents are responding to the bill. And it consumes 66 and 67. Uh, a bill finally passes in 1968, right after Martin Luther King is assassinated, but it's a very weak bill without any enforcement mechanism, uh, and it only covers part of the housing stock. Uh, but it's a big bill in the racial backlash that we've studied of this decade. What was it about fair housing? Did it just hit too close to the core of that American value and, and faith and property and, and freedom and so much of our national identity? That was part of it. You know, Richard Russell, who was a Georgia Southerner uh, who had led the filibuster against civil rights, just said uh, this was the first bill that touched on non-Southern interests. So that Northern Democrats supported civil rights legislation when it came to the South, but when it then affected their communities, uh, their neighborhoods, they weren't so, so supportive. And I think there is an element of truth to that. This was in some ways bolder. Uh, than the first two pieces of legislation. The real estate lobby also mobilizes a very effective campaign uh, to raise concerns uh, about what the bill would do that often weren't grounded in reality, but politically were very effective. And within that sort of swirl of activities, you have the black power movement starting to rise. Right, and this is where Johnson starts to have more separation with the movement and feel more tension, starting with the riots. The riots first in uh, Watts, Los Angeles in 1965, but then more importantly in Detroit and New York, New Jersey in 1967. Johnson starts to become frustrated uh, that the rioters are in some ways undermining everything that he had achieved. He says they are not appreciative, uh, those involved in the rioting, of what he had done for the African-American community. Uh, and he feels most importantly that the rioting is going to give support to conservatives who are saying your programs aren't working. And he felt the same way about the black power movement in many ways. He didn't think that was the right approach. Uh, and he felt that the movement there, through the tactics, was undermining a cause that had won support. Is that law and order have broken down in Detroit, Michigan. Pillage, looting, murder, and arson have nothing to do with civil rights. For those activists, though, they had a different perspective that in some ways Johnson had hit his limits and that Congress was reverting to its old ways and that more radical action was necessary uh, or problems like housing and policing would never be addressed. And then came Vietnam. Vietnam was uh, the biggest flaw, obviously, of Johnson's presidency. Uh, and that wasn't unintentional. And the book talks about Vietnam and how Johnson got deeper and deeper into that war. Uh, and one of the arguments I make uh, is that it wasn't simply adhering to this idea that if Vietnam fell to communism, all the countries surrounding it would as well. It was politics. Johnson believed that to be a successful liberal, you had to be a hawk. You had to be tough on national security or conservatives would get you. And so to protect this coalition he put together for domestic programs, Johnson kept getting deeper and deeper into the war. By 1967 and 68, Vietnam is ripping apart the Democratic Party, and conservatives in Congress who are rebounding use it against the president. They say, Mr. President, if you want money for Vietnam, you're going to have to start cutting domestic spending. You can't have guns and butter. You can have one or the other. So Vietnam uh, is a huge part of his downfall. So as the tide began to turn, he saw many of the young people who had supported the progress of civil rights protesting against his decisions on Vietnam. He does. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, comes out with a speech uh, against the war, which is very disheartening uh, to the president. He almost feels betrayed. Uh, and then many young Democrats by 1967 and 68 who were liberal and who in many ways were sympathetic to what he had done with domestic programs are distancing themselves from the administration. So they'll support 
Eugene McCarthy in 1968, or before his assassination, they support Robert Kennedy, but they don't want Lyndon Johnson to run, uh, or they don't support the person who does run, Hubert Humphrey, the vice president, because of the war. But interestingly, Johnson never cared about the young liberals. What really scared him always was the right, and he was always scared with Vietnam. He was more scared uh, that if he was not tough enough, that if he called for a withdrawal of troops, uh, the Southern Democrats, the Republicans on Capitol Hill were going to really do him in uh, and undercut his support. So uh, all of this culminates in the 1968 election. By March of that year, Johnson decides he's had enough. On March 1st, 1968, he delivers a planned televised speech on Vietnam. At the end, he shocks the nation by okay. stating he will not seek re-election. Accordingly, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Yeah, it's a really dramatic moment uh, with his resignation first. Uh, no one knows he's going to do this. He is despondent by March of 1968. Uh, he's trying to figure out a way to get out of Vietnam. Uh, and he's also sensing he's going to lose. Eugene McCarthy had done much better than most people thought in the New Hampshire primary. So he had often talked about not running again to his advisors. But this time he wanted to do it, so they draft the speech. Uh, and only he knows about it with his speechwriters. They meet with Hubert Humphrey, the vice president, the morning he's going to make a speech. Everyone thinks it's going to be about Vietnam and about a new policy announcement. Uh, Humphrey looks at the draft of the speech, literally reading it in a hotel bed, and gets to the very end where he announces his resignation. And people who are in the room say he looked like he was going to have an anxiety attack. Uh, his face gets white and pale, and he can't believe this is going to happen. And then just a few days later, Martin Luther King is assassinated. And that is, uh, you know, a horrendous moment uh, for many Americans, certainly within the civil rights movement. Uh, when Martin Luther King is killed, they lose faith uh, in the promise of the civil rights movement, in the promise that the government could ever really resolve uh, these issues. That housing bill passes after riots start to take place because many politicians fear uh, that they need to pass this uh, or the violence will get worse. Uh, but it's really a tragic moment because he had been the symbol uh, of, of civil rights progress. Uh, and so when he is assassinated that way, it creates exactly the opposite feelings. What did the nation feel like? In despair. That I mean, it went from hope to despair. There were many people who hated Martin Luther King, and we have to remember that. He was still a controversial figure. Uh, it was still controversial what he was doing in the 1960s, but for many people in the country, white and black, uh, it was absolutely horrendous uh, to learn the news of what had happened. And it changes from hope to despair uh, that the civil rights issue could really be resolved beyond what Congress had already done. And we tend to forget that Martin Luther King was dealing with backlash within his own community as well. Sure, the civil rights movement is fragmenting by the time of his death. Uh, there are many different factions, some who want much more radical approaches to solving uh, issues of racial justice. He himself uh, was trying to deal with issues that before he hadn't uh, addressed for political reasons. So at this time, he's trying to deal with issues of economic justice and fighting poverty. He's also much more critical of the war in Vietnam. Uh, but within the movement, there's a lot of division surfacing. And so the movement as a whole doesn't have the political strength that it had a few years earlier. And Lyndon Johnson feels the effects of that, uh, in addition to obviously all the civil rights activists in the country. And in the final chapters, you talk about the conservative politicians, right, picking up the sort of spoils. Yeah, the concern, it, it starts with all these battles over the budget, which sound familiar probably to today's readers, uh, where conservatives are calling for budget cuts and they're warning about the deficits that Lyndon Johnson is creating. And they're using that to mobilize support uh, for a Republican candidate in 1968 and for renewed conservative strength on Capitol Hill. Richard Nixon is the president who picks up the spoils uh, when Johnson implodes. Interestingly, Nixon doesn't run against the Great Society. In the election, he barely mentions any of the major domestic policies. His major issue is law and order uh, in the cities. Uh, but he doesn't talk about Medicare, Medicaid, or even food stamps or Head Start. Uh, so he picks up the spoils, but Nixon even, 
understands that he's not going to radically remake uh, the programs left behind. But, but Johnson always knew that success in Washington uh, in policy, in creating new policies, doesn't mean political success. By the end of his life, how did Johnson view his legacy? I think he was still proud of it. I think Vietnam he was not proud of, and I think Vietnam he understood had been a huge and tragic mistake uh, for the country and for himself. And he talks about that in his memoirs, how it ultimately killed the great society. And I don't think he ever fully owned uh, to how much he was responsible for that. He wasn't just pushed into it. It wasn't some inevitable thing that happens. He's the president who helps usher that in. But I think he remained very proud of what he did on domestic policy. I do think he believed he lived up to his goal. And that was to create a second New Deal and to transform uh, what the government did. And programs like Medicare for him were huge accomplishments that created a new right uh, that part of the population could expect. Uh, same with civil rights and other bills. So I think that part of, of his life is something he was satisfied with all the problems that emerged. What's your hope for anyone who picks this up? I hope that they learn about the presidency and uh, some of the limits of presidential power. In some ways, that's my major message, that Washington is a town where Congress really is dominant. And I hope they learn how that's the case, but I also hope they see, through civil rights activism, through the election of 64, how Washington can change. And so uh, we don't have to be nostalgic that things were better in the past, but we can understand that voters, average voters, average activists, uh, without major amounts of power can create a new great society, can create a moment where Washington seems different. And I hope that's a message that comes out of the book. That's true. We talk so much about power being locked up in Washington, and yet every step of the way it was the electorate that really drove this. It was. That's the essence of the story. That's why it's titled after a quote from Martin Luther King rather than from Lyndon Johnson. And uh, that is really at the heart of the book. And the book starts with a gridlocked Congress, not unlike what we have today where nothing gets done, but it ends after two years of you know, breathtaking legislation. Whether you like it or don't like what came out of that period, I think everyone can agree it was a pretty phenomenal period in terms of Congress working. Julian Zelitzer, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.